of bio penguins. So we're going to do question number two from the 2015 exam, and it has to do with cellular respiration. So they've given us this diagram that's showing us glycolysis. They're showing us what goes in and what comes out of glycolysis. Um, they're showing us Krebs cycle, again, what goes in, what comes out. And then they're showing us uh, the electron transport chain. And they say, okay, well, cellular respiration includes these different pathways of glycolysis, Krebs cycle, electron transport chain, as represented by the figures. Carbohydrates and other metabolites are oxidized, and the results in energy transfer reactions support the synthesis of ATP. Using the information provided in the diagram, describe one contribution of each of the following ATP synthesis. So let's first look at the first step, looking at this catabolism of glucose and glycolysis and pyruvate oxidation. So if we go back here and we're looking at it, I say, okay, well, we start with glucose. And I end up with pyruvate. How does this allow me to make ATP? Well, I can see right here that there's two ATP molecules that are produced by substrate level phosphorylation. So that's one way where I can make ATP. Another thing is I see that there's this NADH. And that NADH is used over here. So I know that the NADH is being used in electron transport chain um, for some function, which we all know is to allow for the high energy electrons to be moved, electron transport chain to pump protons. Um, and then I also see that there's this acetyl-CoA that's produced. And that acetyl-CoA is moving over here into the Krebs cycle. Um, and so if we look at the scoring guidelines, the options are produces NADH for ETC, produces acetyl-CoA for entry into Krebs cycle, and then, of course, producing the energy for substrate-level phosphorylation of ADP. So let's look at the second step. So if we look at the Krebs cycle, how does this allow us to make ATP? Well, again, we have GTP. And in case you don't know, the difference between ATP and GTP is just the nitrogen phase. ATP has adenine and GTP has guanine. And so if we look here, we of course make ATP by substrate level phosphorylation. We're making the NADH and the FADH2 that's going through the electron transport chain. And then we're also able to just completely break down that glucose. So let's look at the options. So we have produces NADH or FADH2 for use in electron transport chain, releases high energy electrons for use in ETC, provides the energy to pump the protons against their concentration gradient, and then, of course, produces GTP by separate level phosphorylation. And the last one is looking at that proton gradient. So if you look at the gradient, how does this allow us to make ATP? Well, we know that by having the NADH and the FADH2 dropping off those high energy electrons, these protons are getting pumped against their concentration gradient, which is producing a kind of a proton gradient that is used to move down its uh, concentration gradient through ATP synthase. So ATP synthase then turns as that potential energy is released, um, moving it across the membrane. And so if we look at the scoring guidelines for that, we see, of course, flow of protons through the membrane bound ATP synthase generates ATP or provides energy for oxidative phosphorylation of ADP. So the student goes on to talk about catabolism of glucose provides raw materials for the further stages of cellular respiration. First, NADH is produced as used as a proton donor in the electron transport chain. Second, oxidized pyruvate is provided for the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle produces NADH and FADH2, which are necessary proton donors in the electron transport chain. The formation of a proton gradient electron transport chain uses energy from the previous processes to pump protons across the inner membrane. This is necessary because the cell then harnesses the energy of this concentration gradient by using the protons to pass through the ATP synthase, which creates ATP. So very quick and to the point, they use the diagram to explain everything. So this kind of moves into a little evolutionary aspect. So using those different observations, so they're giving you observations. You have to justify the claim that glycolysis first occurred in a common ancestor. Okay, so we have a common ancestor. This common ancestor um, undergo, underwent glycolysis, and that's why we're seeing that all organisms have glycolysis. So let's look at it. So the first claim is that nearly all existing organisms perform glycolysis. Well, that's kind of logical because if our common ancestor had glycolysis, that it would be able to pass on those traits to its offspring. And because it provided a increase in um, survivability, then we're going to see that there's more offspring left. And those offspring, of course, are going to have this trait, which will increase the probability of the trait over time. So now we see that it's, of course, in everything. Glycolysis occurs under anaerobic conditions. Anaerobic just means without oxygen. Early Earth didn't have any oxygen. So that would be a way that we could justify that claim is that by saying that glycolysis must have taken place before the oxygen was started existing in the atmosphere. And then the last thing, glycolysis occurs only in the cytosol. Well, again, this means it must have taken place before there was something that had that membrane. So it must have taken place before membrane brown organelles or before there was a mitochondria. 
And so that's where we're looking at is that this trait was originated early and passed down. Glycolysis like provides selective advantage that's passed on. The origin predates the atmospheric oxygen or predates photosynthesis. And the origin of glycolysis predates our membrane bound organelles, our eukaryotes, or endosymbiosis. So the student goes on, they talk about the fact that all organisms perform glycolysis, an example of homologous cellular, uh, cellular process. So looking at homologous traits just means that these are traits that are the same. Um, and it suggests that all life descended from one common ancestor capable of performing this reaction. Glycolysis occurs in anaerobic conditions. It's further evidence since early Earth atmosphere had low concentration of oxygen, so the process had to be anaerobic. Finally, occurring the cytosol is necessary because the process had to be performed by a very simple organism that lacks the internal membrane structures. And so here we bring in math. And yes, I know we all love when there's math in our FRQ questions. So let's look through this and see how we can figure this out. So it tells us that the researcher estimates that a certain organism has a complete metabolism of glucose, produces 30 molecules of ATP for each molecule of glucose. The energy released from the total oxidation of glucose under standard conditions is 686. So if we were to do it in lab and break down the glucose to get all the energy from it, there should be 686 kilocals per mole. The energy released from the hydrolysis of ATP to ADP under standard conditions, conditions is 7.3 kilomoles. I'm sorry, kilocals per mole. So we want to calculate the amount of energy available from the hydrolysis of 30 moles of ATP. So they've given us this information. So if I know that a mole is 7.3 kilocals, and I need to calculate the total amount of energy, I just multiply. So 30 times um, 7.3 is going to give me 219 kilocals. They then want you to calculate the efficiency of the total ATP production. So in order to do that, I just take the amount that I just calculated, 219. And I divide it by 686 because that's how much there should be if I was doing it in a lab. And that tells me how efficient the system is. So if I divide that, I should get 0.31 or 0.32, which gives me 31 or 32%. And then they want to know, well, what happens to that excess energy? What happens to the other 68% of that energy? Well, it just releases heat. And so here we see the student's calculation. Um, and so since it's a calculate, you don't have to write in complete sentences. I would always write a complete sentence at the end and just say that the total amount of energy is 219, but that's up to you. Um, so you see they do the calculation 30 times 7.3. Notice that they do have units. You must have units on this. Um, and then we want to see the efficiency. So 219 divided by 686 gave us 31.9%. They did not tell you to what number to write it to. Um, so the student did great by putting it to one decimal place. Um, and then they describe what happens. Energy is lost to the environment as heat. And so the last part is proposing a scientific question. This is a old exam question. So this isn't actually still in the standards where we have to pose these questions, but it's still a good application. So the enzymes of the Krebs cycle function in the cytosol of bacteria, but among eukaryotes, the enzymes function mostly in the mitochondria. Propose a question that connects the subcellular location of the enzyme of the Krebs cycle to the evolution of eukaryotes. So you need to come up with some type of question that connected to the evolution of eukaryotes. So since the Krebs cycle occurs in a cytoplasm of mitochondria, does it suggest the mitochondria were once the prokaryotes? So since it's in that kind of interior part of that um, the mitochondria, which is a prokaryote, that is the cytosol of it. So it's kind of connecting that to being part of endocytic theory. So the student said, do mitochondria and modern eukaryotes descend from endocytos prokaryotes that could perform the Krebs cycle? And so that was their question. So I hope that that was helpful. Remember, if you have a pen, you just test by all.